Okay, I know it's been a while since I've made a space video, but I can explain. I was out exploring. I took my little spaceship and I went somewhere no one's ever been before, an alien moon. You see, over the years we've explored a number of exoplanets through different videos. I even tried to name one, unsuccessfully, but recently I've turned my attention away from these remarkable bodies to take a closer look at the objects orbiting them, their exomoons. These remain one of the great unknowns of the cosmos, as they are by nature drastically smaller and dimmer than the planets they orbit, making them nearly impossible to detect, let alone directly observe, using modern methods and technology. At the time of filming this, over 5,000 exoplanets have been recorded, and yet not a single exomoon has been confirmed. But that doesn't mean they don't exist, and a quick look at the planets of this solar system will reveal moons are exceedingly common. Earth has one, Mars has two, Jupiter has at least 95, Saturn has nearly 150, Uranus has 27, and Neptune has 14. Given how numerous moons are here in our home system, it only makes sense that other planets in other systems would have objects of their own orbiting them, and in all probability exomoons likely far outnumber exoplanets. This is why I spent the past few months investigating these unknown worlds, hoping to gain a better understanding of them. However, venturing into uncharted space is always a dangerous endeavor, so to help me navigate this expedition, I brought a few friends of mine along as well. Speculation, reasoning, and deduction, or spec, reese, and ducky as I like to call them, and together we embarked on the first ever exploration of exomoons. Alright, hang on, before we take off, I need to explain the true objective behind this mission. There are virtually infinite different kinds of exomoons to learn about, with all sorts of strange chemical compositions and wacky environmental conditions. But if the moons of this solar system are again any clue, most of these will be unsuitable for habitation. Instead of trying to imagine all the different kinds of geologic wastelands that may exist, you know me, at heart I'm an environmental scientist, and the only reason I'd risk the dangers of space travel is in the hopes of discovering alien life. That's the objective of this mission, to understand what kinds of moons, if any, might harbor life, so that we can better search for them in the future. Does that sound good? Alright, great, then let's visit our first destination, our very own moon, Luna. This is a good place to start because being tied to the Earth, our moon is the only other object we know of that definitely lies within the habitable zone of our sun. Despite this, it's clear to see no life is present here. As we learned in a previous video, the moon is lifeless because it lacks an atmosphere, making it impossible to support liquid water. The moon lacks an atmosphere because its core has solidified, failing to produce a magnetosphere that would otherwise protect its surface. And the moon's core has solidified simply because its small size has caused it to cool much faster than a large object like the Earth. Altogether, this tells us that a moon's habitability has much more to do with its own size and composition than its orbit. Because of this, we can kind of just take orbit out of the equation entirely if we narrow down our search parameters to only include the moons of planets already within the habitable zone. While I can't give you their names or coordinates, Spec assures me according to probability they must exist somewhere. Using Spec's optimal navigation system, we can venture to all the systems that we already know are perfectly balanced, which is how we got here, our first exo destination. This is what Spec calls an Earth analog system, a large rocky planet with a single small companion, together orbiting inside the habitable zone of their star. In this state, once again, it's the planet that's capable of hosting life while the moon is barren. However, Spec says early in this system's history, these bodies made their way through an asteroid belt. 
As the moon collided with these asteroids, its mass increased, causing its inherent core temperature to increase as well, eventually to the point where it was large enough to sustain a molten core. However, my friend Reese tells me that since moons are always smaller than their planets, then as a general rule, the larger a moon is, the larger its planet likely is as well. While there are certainly many different possible ratios of planet to moon, again in uncharted space I like to play it safe and assume that for a moon to get bigger so must its planet. And this introduces two complicated mechanics into the equation. First, being the bigger of the two bodies, the planet will always have a greater gravitational pull on objects, so as a moon grows, the planet likely grows at an even faster rate. This wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for the second complicated mechanic, a phenomenon known as tidal heating. This is where a planet's gravity causes its moon to flex and shift as it orbits around. The internal tension created by these forces is released in the form of heat, providing a secondary source of energy into a moon's core. This means that as our speculative moon increases in size, not only does its inherent core temperature increase, but probability suggests the parent planet is also likely increasing in size, increasing its gravitational influence, and by extension increasing the moon's core temperature as well. This creates a kind of positive feedback loop that can cause a runaway heating process that warms up moons much more for their size than planets. An Earth-sized moon, for instance, would likely orbit such a large planet that it'd be made too hot to host life. While this makes calculating a moon's potential habitability more complicated, Speck assures me, given the infinite possibilities of space, there are at least some systems, such as the one he brought us to, where the internal and external forces balance out. For this to happen, the moon must be large enough to sustain some internal dynamism, while its planet must remain small enough so that its gravitational interactions don't cause it to overheat, resulting in a sizable moon orbiting only a moderately sized planet. Even still, in all likelihood, the planet has been made inhospitable by this gain in size, becoming a greenhouse super-Earth, though around it now orbits a gleam of blue, an atmosphere clinging to a rocky moon. This is the first type of habitable exomoon we'll look at today, those orbiting terrestrial bodies. While Speck says moons like this might not be the most common, I believe they're the easiest to understand, as we've arrived at them based on what we know about our own planet-moon system. However, speculation can only take us so far, and from here on, things start getting even more complicated. At this point, any bigger of a moon and its core will overheat, while any bigger of a planet and the moon will also overheat. As we can see, tidal heating creates an upper limit to the size a moon can remain habitable. So is that it? Are the only promising moons the larger ones orbiting smaller planets? Well, no, as there are two ways to mitigate the effects of tidal heating. First, we can move the moon further away, causing the influence of its planet's gravity to diminish. However, in essence, this is really just altering the planet's gravitational interaction, which has the same effect as altering the planet's mass. But if we again take orbit out of the equation, then there's only one way to keep a moon habitable around larger planets, and that's to decrease its size, as this reduces the amount of inherent heat in the system, counteracting the additional heat being supplied by the parent planet's greater gravity. Here in our solar system, for instance, Jupiter's moon Io is virtually the same size as our moon, meaning it should be equally as inactive, and yet because it orbits a much more massive planet, its core is kept molten, making it the most volcanically active body in the whole solar system. Reese tells me the same thing happens pretty much everywhere, so while Jupiter might not orbit in the habitable zone, he can bring us to a gas giant that does. However, even after arriving at a Jupiter-Io analog within the Goldilocks zone, we'll find a volcanic moon alright, but one that still lacks an atmosphere. This clues us into another confusing mechanic in the exomoon equation, atmospheric stripping. 
You see, despite Io's volcanism releasing huge quantities of gases onto its surface, Io also falls within Jupiter's magnetosphere, which ionizes these gases, pulling them away from the moon. In total, Jupiter strips about one ton of gas away from Io every second, which has left its surface bare. So does this mean gas giants can't have habitable moons after all? Well, again, no. But to understand why, we need to leave Jupiter for Saturn, where we'll find a moon known as Titan. This moon is balanced precariously, close enough that it's geologically active, allowing gases to escape onto the surface, but far enough away that Saturn doesn't steal these gases away faster than they're replenished, allowing Titan to amount an atmosphere thicker than even the Earth's, one so dense it obscures the surface below. Together, Io and Titan represent two different extremes, suggesting habitability around gas giants is a balancing act between tidal heating and atmospheric stripping, and my friend Rhys tells me that somewhere on this graph these forces can balance out. However, if you really think about it, both the degree of tidal heating and the rate of atmospheric stripping depend on the same variable, the moon's orbital distance to its planet. This clues us into the fact that for any given planet, there's an area around it where the atmosphere is stripped away too fast, and a distance from it where the gravitational forces are too weak to cause tidal heating. Though again, Rhys assures me between these two extremes, there must exist a range where these forces equal one another and conditions become favorable. In other words, exomoons need to find their way into not just one, but two different habitable zones. First, they must be lucky enough to orbit a planet within the stellar habitable zone, where the amount of sunlight allows liquid water to exist. But then, moons must also orbit within the planetary habitable zone, where they experience some tidal heating but not too much, lose some of their gases to their planet's magnetosphere, but only at a similar rate that their volcanism replaces it. Only when a moon occupies both of these orbital parameters does life begin to become possible. Knowing all this, it might sound like habitable exomoons are less common around gas giants, but Reese assures me that's not actually the case, and to show me why, he brought me back here. This is what he tells me is a typical Jovian system, a massive gas planet with at least three large moons. One of these moons, like Io, has strayed too close to its parent, producing a torrid place with too much volcanism and too little atmosphere. Another one of its moons is 50% water, but orbits too far away, freezing it up into one big ball of ice. But the third large moon of this planet falls between these other two, where internal volcanism produces gases at the same rate they're stripped away, allowing the moon to maintain a stable atmosphere for millions of years. Reese tells me that's the true advantage gas planets have, multiple moons, each one a roll of the dice. To put this into perspective, here in our solar system, there's only one relatively large moon around a smaller planet, giving us a single chance for a type 1 moon. Meanwhile, there are four large moons around Jupiter, six large moons around Saturn, four around Uranus, and Neptune has one, totaling 15 chances for one of them to fall within the ideal orbit. Out of all of these, while I wouldn't say any fall perfectly within the planetary habitable zone, Titan sits the closest, as evidenced by its existent but stifling atmosphere. Of course, Titan still falls outside of the stellar habitable zone, so it remains lifeless, but Reese assures me plenty of gas giants are to be found in their habitable zones, and wherever we find them, they warrant a closer look. Okay, so those are pretty much the two modes of exomoon habitability. Large moons orbiting terrestrial planets or small moons orbiting gas giants. However, my friend Ducky is telling me there's one last type of moon that's a lot less finicky and a lot more promising than these other two types. Ones that can be found not by looking at a moon's size, but its composition. To understand what Ducky means by this, he first took me back to study the four big moons of Jupiter. 
While the closest of these, Io, has burned off any volatile substances, leaving only a rocky body, the other three, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto, orbit far enough away so as to remain geologically inactive. This has preserved the original composition of these moons, and what we'll find is water. Lots of water. Despite its size, Europa contains more water than the entire Earth, making up about 16% of its total mass. Callisto contains even more water, though its larger size means this only accounts for 9% of its mass. Ganymede, however, is the largest moon in our solar system and contains 26 times more water than the Earth, making up nearly half of its entire mass. While none of these support atmospheres, beneath their icy crust, heat generated by tidal forces in the moon's core warms this ice up, melting it into a mantle of water deeper than any ocean on Earth. Each of these moons, plus several more orbiting other planets in the solar system, is expected to harbor a massive subterranean ocean, and based on our current understanding, could all potentially support their own forms of life. Though to be clear, the habitability of oceans beneath these icy worlds remains another great mystery of the cosmos. Some believe life is possible in these water mantles. Some argue that it's impossible, though the only consensus we've reached is that we won't quite know for sure until we've better explored them. However, my friend Ducky tells me he can take us to a place where we don't need to worry about that. Here, we'll find an analog to the Jupiter Ganymede system, a gas planet with at least one moon composed mostly of water. Only this planet was dragged in just a little closer to its star, bringing it within the distance where ice on its moon's surface begins to melt, forming a second ocean. As it came closer, eventually all the ice melted, revealing a glistening blue ball, an ocean moon. Ducky says these will occur whenever gas giants stray too close to their star, which is more often than you'd think. And this may in fact be the biggest reason to start looking into exomoons. If you ask me, an ocean world is nearly the perfect place for life to arise, as it was within the primordial oceans of Earth where life first began here, and so the prospect of there being countless alien oceans virtually everywhere is incredibly exciting. If life can persist on both melted and frozen ocean moons, then we may come to find alien life almost everywhere we look, perhaps even here in our own cosmic backyard. Knowing this, virtually every gas planet we've discovered has the potential to host life among its moons, no matter whether they're orbiting within the habitable zone or not. Overall, while this may be a complex subject, what I hope to have illustrated is that ultimately, exomoon habitability is determined by the same exact conditions as exoplanets, mainly their size, composition, and orbit. And this raises the final question I want to pose today. Where might life be more likely to be found? Planets or moons? And by extension, which one should we prioritize searching for? While we have no way of knowing for sure, I have at least two reasons to believe exomoons may in fact be more promising. First, their orbits. You see, most of the exoplanets we've discussed on this channel and the vast majority of those we've discovered are tidally locked to their stars, meaning only one side sees the light while the other is in complete darkness. While this may not totally ruin a planet's chances of habitability, well, it doesn't help, and certainly limits the scope of life to be found. Exomoons, on the other hand, are, well, they're tidally locked too, but not to their star, but rather their planet. And because their planets orbit around the star, this exposes their surfaces to light much more evenly. In fact, because most exomoons are dwarfed by their planets, many have a unique light situation where one side of the moon is sunny, one side is night, but a significant portion will bask in their planet's reflected light as well, creating a zone of planetary twilight that travels around the moon independently from starlight. And I must say, after all the time I've spent exploring exomoons, my favorite part is always experiencing planetary twilight. 
This has been to say that exomoons are almost never limited by even the most extreme of orbits and do not suffer from many of the problems planets do. Beyond that, I believe exomoons have one other distinct advantage over exoplanets, and that's their proximity to other exomoons. If we moved a Jupiter-like system into the habitable zone, not only would Ganymede's surface melt, but so would Europa's and Callisto's. Given how many moons gas giants can have, and how many of them are mostly water, it's very possible for a planet to host a collection of ocean moons. This opens up the chances for cross-contamination, with the potential for an ecosystem spanning multiple worlds to arise. By now, I hope you're starting to see just how many opportunities for life exist among exomoons. That was my real goal with this expedition, to bring attention to the fact that there's a whole category of worlds out there we are yet to even begin studying. Worlds that are not only endlessly fascinating, but may in fact be our best bet for finding life beyond Earth. But hopefully, now that I've made this first exploration into exomoons and returned home safely, others will follow, and before long, we'll start getting real answers to the many mysteries these places present.